Hey, I watched a movie, it was called Disobedience, and everybody knows that I am deeply and unabashedly interested in ascetic Judaic culture. I want to know about the practices and the particulars and see it depicted in various media. And so in this case, it had nothing to do with the fact that Rachel Weiss and Rachel McAdams were on the cover looking like they were about to kiss each other. It had nothing to do with it. Nor the warning once you start the movie that said that there was uh, graphic nudity and, <laughs> and some intense sex scenes. Uh, I don't want to hear the conspiracy theories related to this, okay? It had nothing to do with it. That played zero factor in my choice to watch this movie. So again, called Disobedience. This is a 2017, it's like a romance drama. And the story is, uh, yeah, I'm just going to spoil it. Nobody's going to watch it anyway. But the story is that Rachel Weiss is returning to her hometown because she's heard that her father has died. And uh, she has these couple of friends who are there. She knows the community and they know her. But she has a couple of friends who are there. Rachel McAdams and this guy. They used to be a trio. And they were always together and always close. But since Rachel Vice left, she went to New York. Went off to get her own career and do her own thing. And leave the ascetic nature, at least, of the religion. Rachel McAdams and the guy who was the third. And I like this actor. I don't remember what his name is. But I've seen him in numerous things. But they got married. So now they're in this marriage, and uh, Rachel Weiss returns, and she's just trying to navigate this very rigid community who is very suspicious of somebody who didn't adhere to their rules and took off and, and wanted to go do their own thing. So she's back, and then you see some sparks flying between Rachel McAdams and Rachel Weiss. So uh, you already know, of course, uh, why her father was... Not especially happy with her and why the community was suspicious. It turns out that you learn as the story goes on that they had had a tryst and they were caught at some point in their childhood. And now Rachel McAdams is married to the guy who was part of the trio. But it's a marriage of convenience. It's a marriage of culture and adherence to the culture. It's not a marriage of passion or the kind of love that we expect nowadays in these kinds of relationships. So, for example, they have a, a nightly, they have a, a Friday night coupling that they're supposed to have. <laughs> she she just very mechanically removes her clothes and they do their thing, and that's the end of that. And she has to do it every Friday, and that's just the way that goes. So, Rachel Vice is uh, inserted, for lack of a better term, in, back into the situation, and they are meeting with various p members of the community. They, they're talking about rabbinic questions and rules, and she is pushing back. She's got more modern sensibilities, so she resists a lot of the framing that they use when they're talking about what women's role should be and what marriage is about. So, he is in line for a Jew promotion. I, that's not the best way to say that. He's in line to uh, get gets elevated in some way uh, to be like the rabbi. They call him a rav, like the mid-size SUV, but I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure that just means rabbi. Is that a mid-size or is that more like a compact? A rav four? I'm not sure. Anyway, so he's got this extra pressure to have an intact household to be able to get this promotion. And a lot of the people in the community are suspicious of Rachel Weiss having returned because of her influence. So eventually, yes, of course, the Rachels make a Rachel squared and uh, do some kissing. And they say they're not going to do it anymore. But they end up in public somewhere. They try to hide somewhere and do some more kissing. And they're caught. And then the word gets around that that had happened, even though it wasn't certain, but it eventually gets back to her husband. And so he confronts her, there's a big fight, and everything comes out, and that's that, except I have to rewind a bit. I'm not sure where in the midst of this has happened, but there was a sex scene. It was a quality sex scene. <laughs> It's actually good because they're supposed to be more conservative, right? So it's not like all out, uh, you know, let's bring the toys or anything like that. It's uh, relatively tame, but also they go a little crazy for this kind of, <laughs> kind of a couple. Which was appreciated. Uh, I understand why they undertook this kind of a story. Rachel Weisz is also a producer, I think, on it. But just for this scene alone, it was done pretty tastefully for the stature of actresses that they have in this. But it also had its own extreme aspects, we'll say, that worked within the context of the storytelling and were pretty hot, like, honestly. So I'm not going to explicitly describe what effing happened. If you want to look it up on some untoward website. Anyway, so leaving that aside. 
we get to the point where they're confronting each other and yelling and she's saying, okay, this is what I actually want. I wanted her to come back. I wanted to be with her. I don't want to be with you. And so at one point, Rachel Weiss is leaving. She's getting on a plane and she's going to be gone, but she returns. And you think that Rachel McAdams took off somewhere, did something drastic, but it turns out she's okay. And she comes back, but she tells him, I want to be free. I don't want to be with you. I don't want to be married and I'm pregnant. <laughs> so, uh, there are a lot of things going on right now. And then he has to go, which, oh my gosh this is one thing as we'll talk about when I evaluate the whole thing then they have to go to his speech where he's supposed to give this speech that is about him accepting this promotion or whatever and so they are sitting in the audience and he has to give the speech and he's super nervous about it because everything that's happening at home which thanks for that and then he gives another kind of speech that instead of the one he was supposed to give that is pretty much rejecting everything that he has stood for and that the religion stands for and everything else in support of the very particular thing that's going on with his wife and uh, talking about freedom and essentially siding with her over the rest of humanity and history, etc. So that is the movie. Then he's in the good graces of the women and the movie's sense of morality. And then Rachel Weiss ends up in a taxi and she's going back to New York. And uh, Rachel McAdams runs up to the taxi and talks about it and says, okay, well, uh, you know, you're going to be a mother and you just have to do good things or fight through. I don't know. She said some kind of generic thing about that being a mother. But anyway, that is the movie, Disobedience. So the reason that I want to talk about this is not actually because of the sex scene. It is because of what it is actually saying about morality and culture. Because it's something that we took for granted. Now, 40 years ago, it would have made perfect sense to have this kind of a movie where you have this excessive asceticism that is putting people in boxes and preventing them from flourishing in ways that at least at the time we thought were very important. You know, the things where you you would have some kind of a passionate connection to somebody else or connection to a profession or just uh, want to be this or be that in your personal life. And it was really important for you to express that individual internal inclination. It was something that we were experimenting with. What does it really mean? Who are you? And how much should you be expressing that? As opposed to accepting and imbibing the things that are around you, the culture that you're growing up in. So in this particular movie, the moral of the story is that if girls have a particular sexual interest, then they should be allowed to pursue that sexual interest. And any tradition or interest that goes against that is wrong. It's bad. Remember, the whole framing of the setup of the movie is that Rachel Weiss is returning to her hometown so that she can see, go to her dead father's funeral. But that is just the framing mechanism for her to return and have a sexual relationship with Rachel McAdams. That is really the point. Now, by the end of the movie, they don't end up together. They just end up, you know, friends. They're going to support each other while she goes and has a baby but is getting divorced from her husband. But she's keeping the baby. And Rachel Weiss is just going back to her old life, uh, her life back in New York and just going to do that. Mind you, also, <laughs> one of the things that was hilariously on the nose was that his entire speech at the end that he's giving to a bunch of very strict Jewish adherents is about the right to choose. That's what he's saying. He says it over and over and over again that people should have the right to choose and make their own choice and, and choice and choice. And obviously that language rhetorically, what is the only thing that that is actually referenced to? It's abortion. So it was funny that she decides not to kill the baby, but that is the analog when he she's he's using all that language in this discussion. And in a more direct way, obviously, it's the right to choose who you want to have sex with. That is the point. And so culturally, the question is, uh, like I said, 40 years ago, it was more important to be able to break out of these more strictly defined roles and strictly defined expectations about what people have to do. But it's saying culturally that it is more important whoever you happen to want to have sex with at any given time than all of tradition or religion or commitment to community or things that you agreed to or somebody that you care about or what you can do for community in general. All of those things fall by the wayside just based on who do you want to have sex with right now. To think about it in other terms, just imagine that it's the same exact storyline, except it's a guy who's in the title role. He doesn't want to have sex with somebody of the same sex. He just wants to have sex with somebody of the opposite sex who is younger and more physically attractive. That's the only point. So... 
if you apply the same logic to that situation where he is married and he has all these expectations related to that marriage and she has some profession that she is trying to support that is better supported by the fact that they stay together and have this relationship and the community is is based on these responsibilities that people have to each other like within a family based on these shared ideals that have been shared for years and years and years hundreds thousands of years by this point and he says no i want to get rid of all those things because i want to have sex with this younger girl who is much more physically attractive than the person that i'm with of course in that that becomes a grotesquerie that's that's like uh you're a jerk you're just doing something that is beneficial to you you're being incredibly selfish and that's the only point so in that context then we can all criticize what selfish looks like and say that well there are other things that you should be taking into consideration here but in this, the framing is entirely that she is 100% in the right. It was horrible for anybody to have expectations culturally of her to do one thing or another. And that the great liberation, the great thing that happens by the end morally, is that she gets released of all the expectations and all the things that people have built all the way up to this point. Now, I am not Jewish. I don't, <laughs> it doesn't make much of a difference to me. And the biggest thing for me, historically, is that women were subject to a lot of very weak men. So men who were emotionally weak, and I use that in a very particular context, but that were emotionally weak and physically incapable and uh, didn't provide for their families and they tyrannically used what authority they had because they weren't able to do it outside of the home. So they would use it on their children or use it on their wives and their wives would be beholden to that. They wouldn't have any other options just because the society at the time didn't give them other options. So the problem, the scourge historically was weak men. And then you had a government that acted paternalistically that would force women through legal systems and other means that would force women to just be committed to these kinds of relationships where they were subject to that kind of tyranny. So that's my problem with it historically. But... In this case, it's saying that, okay, he wasn't a, a jerk. He wasn't abusive. He was providing for her. The only question was, is she sexually attracted to him? And who is she, she sexually attracted to more? And it turned out she was more sexually attracted to Rachel Weisz, which is understandable. Me too. But when that is the only question, that's the only emotional valence, that's the only cultural artifact that is going to push one in one direction or the other, is just who are you sexually attracted to, then it should be extremely obvious that that is an incredibly selfish way to look at the world, and a superficial way to look at the world, and probably the worst basis for a culture or a shared community or anything else that you could possibly have. Just what um, sexual interest do I have today, and whatever that sexual interest interest happens to be that's how I act I mean obviously everybody has been in relationships where they have been with somebody where it started out they were very sexually attracted to them but over time it waned dramatically and so they either moved on you know if it's in your younger days you move on you go find somebody else or if it's in your older days then you have a whole bunch of other things that you base your relationship on you know you might not be as uh, passionately sexually interested in those people by that point but you have a whole bunch of other connections that you have shared for a very long time and shared interests and things that you love about the person that are amazing but the point is you have other connections there are other more significant things psychologically that you're looking at that keep you interested or engaged and other shared standards or morals that are more important than oh here's the person i happen to be sexually interested in but there is and this is something that is going to be very difficult to digest and i understand that but again there is a difference between men and women now look at the way that superficial male heroes are treated. Now, it's a little harsh to call him superficial in some cases, but just follow what I'm saying here. So somebody like James Bond, he is a, a superficial male hero and, uh, you know, something that is supposed to be an idealized male. And what does he do? So he sleeps with beautiful women. He spends a whole lot of money. He gets to stay in luxurious places. He looks great, etc., etc. He gets to be a spy. But his primary interest, the thing that motivates him the most, is his dedication to his country. That's what he wants to do first. That's the most important thing. So when you strip away everything else, he still has an altruistic interest. That's what's most important to him. Uh, same thing like uh, if you look at the, the father from Taken. What is his primary interest? Is it uh, trying to get something for himself? Is it trying to gain money or, or power? No. His primary interest is protecting his family, is saving his daughter, is saving whoever else. 
If you look at male heroes and the way that they are portrayed, or just if you go beyond that more superficial realm and you look at at male characters in other contexts, the point is that men who are selfish get branded as villains. The ones, the men who are just after money or just after fame or just after power, they are treated as villains. But the women who are just after money or just after fame or just after power or just uh, after their own sexual liberation, they are treated as heroes. Because men and women are different. Psychologically, they have different interests and different goals. That Hulk, the the Hulk show, the She-Hulk, I watched, uh, I think, the first two episodes or something of that. But the point of that was that when she accidentally got the Hulk powers, she didn't say, okay, well, what can I do to help people? Or, uh, you know, what are the ways that I can use this to be most beneficial? How can I protect the people I care about? No, it was nothing like that. It was all about, uh, well, I just want stuff for myself. How do I get stuff for myself? How do I use this to benefit me? And how is this going to screw up things for me in my life? But if you go through, you can see these archetypal structures uh, wherein men and women want different things and men, male and female heroes and villains are treated different ways. Uh, One other one that I have definitely seen recently is that female villains, they try very hard and very often to make sure that they have some redeemable aspect. They'll do something to redeem them to say that, oh, well, they were victimized in this way or that way. And so therefore they can be redeemed. Whereas male villains are more often be irredeemable. But the point is, uh, you can just look look at this movie, look at the way, and look at all movies in this way. What are the actual moral standards that are being proffered? What, what's being said here? What is being suggested as the right way to interact in the world? Because the movie has a position. It has a moral position. And this one is very clear. Just like most movies have some kind of a moral position. Just in the case of men, it's more often to depict them as doing something selfless. Whereas in the case of women, it's more likely to depict them as doing something selfish. And in both cases, the movie is saying that they're doing the right thing. So anyway, that that was the only reason to talk about disobedience. And like I said, uh, generally, the movie was reasonably well made. It was very well acted. It was a fine, simple story that was exploring a straightforward idea that's been explored in a million different ways. Uh, the same exact kind of setup and, and payoff. But uh, it had a, a good sex scene in the center. So, <laughs> so that's... <laughs> that's that movie that's disobedience i'm going to do that's right i'm going to do a book recommendation and oh i'll just do pride and prejudice uh most everybody's heard of that jane austen the dialogue in that really is uh that kind of fun uh nabokov actually he didn't write about pride and prejudice but it was another one of jane austen's books where he did this entire breakdown of how she manages characters and relationships and how there's this complex weave of psychological interactions that the lay reader doesn't really understand but she was an expert at and that's the reason that she is so lauded amongst the greats of literature he definitely appreciates the complexity and the way that she writes even though on the surface it seems like a simple wish fulfillment story of you know uh, privilege and money and handsome men talking to super hot ladies and all that kind of stuff anyway yeah that was this one i hope all is well i'll see you on the next one all right bye